Um, this is a, a project uh, that has two papers already in the pipeline, uh, one out and one uh, coming out, I think, in February. Uh, this will be the third paper uh, in that project. There might be a, a fourth, but I'm anxious to actually move on to other species. It comes out of conversations with a neuroscience friend of mine who uses animals in long-term potentiation studies in neuroscience. Uh, he used to use primates. He doesn't for... Uh, he used to use primates, sorry, someone's signaling that can't hear me, um, and doesn't anymore um, for ethical reasons and wanted to have a model to express that. Um, he's uh, moving away from rats now to zebrafish, and so um, he hopes this will, this will help with that. I'm going to actually skip a few slides here, um, simply because I, uh, I want to actually get in as many of the more substantive stuff as I can. I can speak to that stuff. Uh, more uh, in Q&A. Uh, there's a number of changes afoot that have actually made uh, me excited about discussions about uh, the use of animals uh, scientifically. Uh, my focus is going to be on chimpanzees, not because I'm chimp-centric, uh, but because those are the, the animals I'm most comfortable talking about. Much ink has been spilt, uh, reasonably defending the ascription or defending the reasonable ascription of mental states or psychological states to a number of animals. There's a, a few references there. I can give you more. It's only a sample uh, of those. Uh, importantly, the three R's framework, so refinement, reduction, and replacement, uh, that's framing and increasingly framing uh, the use of animals in uh, captive research, harmful research, particularly in North America and Western Europe actually doesn't hold skeptically uh, views about uh, the psychological states of other animals. Refinement has to do with reducing suffering. Uh, replacement has to do with um, uh, going to uh, non-sentient uh, models or models that have, or we have reason to think, will suffer less than those currently used. And reduction has to do with reducing the number of animals so, so that the cost to the animals is as minimal as possible while still yielding statistical significant studies in science. And so what you can't describe that as is a skepticism of animal minds, and that's very exciting. Uh, even more uh, significantly for folks like me working in applied ethics, uh, anthropocentric speciesism, uh, 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 Peter Singer uh, did a, a lovely job explaining speciesism last night, um, as is uh, one of his things, um, uh, is losing its luster. It, losing its luster uh, because it's an inadequate ground for moral significance, and you can do, you can do that in a number of ways, as has been demonstrated uh, in our discussions. A point to remind one of, of this that I use in my classes, um, neither therapeutic, therapeutic cloning um, uh, or abortion are obviously wrong, uh, even though they revolve around the destruction of individuals of our species. Um, they would be obviously wrong if something like anthropocentric speciesism was correct. And so we already have within our cultural currency a recognition that something else is going on in these moral spaces that requires more honest uh, thinking. We should be wary of using arguments from marginal cases. I work in the philosophy of autism as well as in uh, this area. Uh, and I worry about uh, what this, uh, the expressive effect of this on folks who are differently uh, abled. But uh, in defense of those who use uh, such appeals, and I've been known to use them myself in publications, it's an artifact of a philosophical space where human exceptionalism is assumed. If you get rid of humans at the center of the moral universe, there are no margins for other humans to populate. And so if we can move away from that, uh, we move away from the discomfort of using those who are either at a different level of developmental maturity or functional, um, uh, functional um, um, endowment. The traditional distinction between uh, moral agent and moral patient is becoming increasingly strained. I'm getting interested in this with the burgeoning literature on uh, pro-social behavior and norm-laden activity in other animals, uh, not just primates but canids and cetaceans as well. To be a moral agent in the tradition, uh, in the literature, is uh, someone who can act morally, and this is roughly, note the italics, to engage in normatively laden uh, activities that are informed by considerations of ultimate goods. Uh, this is typically taken to be sufficient for high moral status. That is the status we enjoy here in this room. To be a moral patient is to enjoy a to be specified moral status, despite the lack of a capacity to make uh, claims on one's own behalf. I'll try and speak louder. Sorry, people are not hearing me at the back. Is that, is that right? Uh, so here's, here's ways in which uh, th uh, things are getting increasingly strained. 
uh, for this uh, moral agent, moral patient uh, background. Chimpanzees uh, can and do make demands on others to be treated in certain ways, sometimes other than how they are treated. Uh, there's a lot of literature. Have a look at Flack and DeWall. DeWall, uh, Bosch has already been me mentioned. Um, Matsuzawa is someone who's very important uh, for this kind of uh, uh, work. Uh, they will actually outline how within the social context these uh, apes maneuver to be treated in different ways than they currently uh, are. That's important. It's an, it's an expression of preference uh, in treatment. Uh, the relevant literature, this is actually, as I can attest by the references, caught the attention of researchers in the field. They recognize the norm ladenness of these activities uh, and write about it. It has, more importantly for my work here, actually uh, entered into the space of animal welfare literature. Um, there are a number of discussions about how to get uncooperative chimpanzees more cooperative in a research uh, context. This is in part because cooperation is an important uh, part of the enrichment of the captive animals. Uh, they fare better and the protocols themselves do better. The results are better when the animals themselves are less stressed out. And part of that is to actually seek their cooperation. I kid you not, it's in the literature discussed in this way. Have a look at the Institute of Medicine report on the necessity of chimpanzees that came out in 2011, acquiescence as a part of their discussion space. Uh, in the context of uh, so-called humane experimental animal science, the three hours protocol being a, a reflection of that, uh, the relevant uh, animal research subjects, the demands they make on their captors are being increasingly taken seriously. And, and part of what animal welfare science uh, is doing is trying to understand what the preferences are of these animals so that they can fare better within uh, captive uh, contexts. Now start to piece this all together and people like me get really excited. So in a moral framework devoid of anthropocentric speciesism, significant pressure mounts to recognize the demands made by captive other than human animals on their captors and demands made by free living other than human animals on conspecifics in relevantly similar ways to what we see falling under discussions of respect for persons and human bioethics. And you've got to remember, step back from all of the uh, headiness of the debate around things like uh, autonomy, particularly things like formal autonomy, and engage bioethics where it's happening in healthcare institutions. Uh, if you read discussions of end-of-life care, if you read discussions about judgments of futility, these discussions are, are shaped by wanting to be respectful of the preferences of those patients or their values and attitudes. And so we're starting to see convergence here in a way that's actually really, really exciting. So to resist this pressure flirts with incoherence within the relevant sciences because what I'm doing here, what people like Laurie Marino and Steve Wise are doing are using the sciences to actually show the burgeoning knowledge we have of the relevant psychological capacities of the relevant animals, uh, to ignore that is to actually dismiss the value of that science, if nothing else. Also within a context of animal welfare where they actually purport to be um, um, framing their work in terms of humane experimentation, that stretches credulity if they're ignoring the preferences, express preferences of the animal research subjects. And the arbitrariness comes again from the failure of anthropocentric speciesism uh, to provide uh, a wall between us and uh, other than human animals. Um, it has been explicitly noticed in this, uh, noted in the scientific literature that uh, other than human animals cannot consent to being used in, in animal research. So the Weatherall report uh, came out sponsored in part by the Wellcome Trust and the Royal Society is one of those reports that, that make this claim. They conclude then that simply because an animal hasn't consented to research uh, uh, doesn't cause them a problem because of course they can't and so of course they haven't. Uh, but that's not, that's not the end of the discussion so let's grant that claim. Okay, so. Uh, chimpanzees can't, uh, can't actually uh, consent or give their informed consent to research. We can actually uh, make this uh, stronger claim by using pediatric research ethics to actually make the claim that they can't assent either, and I'll explain assent in a certain second, but that, or in a, in a second, but that doesn't actually uh, stop the, uh, the problem uh, either. Uh, so let me actually uh, introduce you to this third level of decisional uh, authority or capacity in pediatric research ethics, dissent. It contrasts with informed consent, which has to do with understanding that it is research, not therapy, understanding the risks, understanding you can withdraw at any time. Um, that's the sort of thing that involves informed consent. Assent 
which tends to, in pediatric research ethics, apply to, to mature minors between the ages of roughly 7 and 14, has to do with explaining the research to, their, uh, to, to them in a way that they understand, so they understand also some of the discomfort that they might experience, as well as the value it has for their patient population. Um, and so let's imagine that chimpanzees can't assent either. We need to ask the question, well, um, what do we need for descent? And this is for children in pediatric research ethics that aren't mature, right, who aren't even, uh, even children between the uh, ages of 7 and 14. These are, these are subjects that are, are below 7 years old. Um, here's, here's what you need for descent in those contexts. Um, you need to actually uh, be able to experience harm, stress, and distress. You need to be able to be aware uh, of it happening and some of the causal circumstances that bring it, out, uh, bring it about and have the capacity to express that it stops. Right? Those are the, the three kinds of capacities uh, that we would uh, expect. Though it is a controversial construct, particularly when parents are involved, uh, it's important for protecting uh, the interests of a very young population of research subjects who are incredibly vulnerable. Uh, I'm not denying also that there aren't uh, dissimilarities between the pediatric research population of subjects and chimpanzees, but within a context where we're talking about uh, the um, failure of anthropocentric speciesism and taking seriously scientists claiming that they want to actually engage in humane experimental science, we get to actually suggest, well, there is this construct uh, that chimpanzees uh, seem to uh, meet because they can experience pain and distress and stress. And for those of you wondering about the skepticism of this, this isn't an area of skeptical doubt among the, the researchers that use chimpanzees. I've as yet to see that expressed by those who work with these apes, right? They don't, they don't deny that they can experience distress and harm. Um, they're actually, they can actually be aware of and understand some of the causal conditions. This is what causes trauma that uh, expresses behavioral atypicalities in this research population, again, Primate researchers that use these animals in their protocols are well aware of the trauma that's, that's caused. Think of Harry Harlow, a person that actually went about um, ex ex experimentally bringing about trauma in his macaque research population. Again, no doubt that this, this is uh, happening and that they express um, desires or preferences not to be a part of that set of events by trying to escape in their cages, by, by screaming, Right? by huddling in, in the corner of the cages, by spitting, right? throwing feces. This is all a part of what the scientists are well aware of as expressions of dissent. So imagine, imagine a world where we take this seriously. Imagine we're talking to a number of scientists, I know some, who want to take dissent much more seriously than is currently on the cards. What would be a world uh, where we do this? Well, in such a world, as in pediatric research ethics, if the chimpanzee dissents, it may actually terminate their inclusion in the, in the research. Right? I say may because we have to consider these. It's the same thing in pediatric research ethics. That's where I get most of this list. So if when presenting no more than slightly greater than minimal risk, the study benefits other relevantly, chimp relevantly similar chimpanzees, we might want to still include them even though they're dissenting. If where the study presents minimal risk, the study could yield important generalizable knowledge about the chimpanzees whether the resistance can be overcome with positive reinforcement training, and whether, the re whether when responsive to PRT, the research places the chimpanzee at long-term risk of serious physical or psychological harms. Think of HIV research, hepatitis C research. Uh, uh, Dergrazia uh, has a number of these discussions in his place too, but I, I take these particularly from pediatric research ethics. Uh, it will also be important not to destroy this capacity. In a, in a context where this becomes morally significant, it is also significant not to act in a way to destroy it. Because simply because they cannot now dissent because you've destroyed the capacity doesn't mean the discussion uh, is over. In fact, it's inconsistent with an appeal, or, or sorry, in, inconsistent with an ethical framework that respects uh, this uh, capacity. And just like in a pediatric research context, you don't get to assume a green light until you actually have them reacquire that capacity. So that calls for some kind of intervention and rehabilitation. Um, in a context where they, where they have lost this capacity and we're thinking about those questions I gave you about um, uh, whether the, the science is still actually useful. We can think of uh, surrogates that can step in and decide to keep them enrolled. 
thank you. But only if it's in their best interests. Again, think in terms of uh, pediatric uh, research uh, context. Research conditions, and this is one of the most important points to make in this kind of uh, conceptual uh, framework or ethical framework uh, for scientists working with, with this kind of uh, a framework in, in situ. You need to actually be very careful to make sure that the conditions of the protocols don't destroy the capacity that you're watching for when you actually keep these animals in p p participating in this research. The reason why that's most important is Jane Goodall and Michael Balls are on record making the claim that there are no captive contexts in which chimpanzees can fare well. Now, imagine we don't buy that there literally are no captive contexts. Maybe Matsuzawa has actually discovered that, one of the reasons why I raised that question with Laurie. Uh, maybe there are others like Yerkes where those adult chimpanzees are doing quite fine. Think of DeWall's work uh, with, those, with those adults and uh, uh, sub-adults in uh, Yerkes. The question still needs to arise, what, what conditions will destroy this capacity? Those conditions are off bounds for including these animals uh, in, this, in this research. Benefit arguments will lose their punch in this context. So here's a, an example of a benefit argument. I don't need to actually run through the premises and conclusion. You're all familiar with this, I'm sure. It's just I use this to teach students the benefit argument for the use of animals in, in science. Uh, notice that it's anthropos it depends on an anthropocentric speciesism, that is a devaluing of all non-human animals to actually make this possible for, for their use with uh, humans. If you, if you actually uh, look at benefit arguments used by philosophers where they don't assume an anthropocentric speciesism, R.G. Fry stuff is where you will, he will advocate the use of humans. And it's not an academic claim. He will advocate the use of humans. The best animal model of human diseases are humans. And so in that context, guess what? Right? Now, if you think of that as, a, as an ethical step backwards, as I do, uh, this is a reason not to go in that direction, but in the other. Here's, here's, a, here's a, another way to actually uh, then uh, put this. Uh, when you think of trapdoor clauses, let me finish with the trapdoor clauses because I know I'm running out of time. Trapdoor clauses are the clauses you see in Europe, uh, the clauses you've seen advocated by a Scientific American, their editorial to call to, for the end for, of chimpanzee research, was unless there's something serious that happens, some kind of public health crisis where that pandemic can only be modeled in chimpanzees. That's, that's the kind of trapdoor clause I have in mind. That doesn't take seriously, asking the chimpanzees for their, or testing them for dissent, t taking their agency seriously and including them in those protocols. It doesn't take seriously their dissent when we're actually using them in those protocols. Again, with a reminder that anthropocentric speciesism has failed in this context. And so these trapdoor clauses do not ethically permit the reintroduction of chimpanzees that are dissenting and are morally significantly dissenting from inclusion in the relevant research. And, and that's it. Uh, thank you. And there's a, a, a very small version of some of the some of the bibliography. But thank you for the for the opportunity.